And so what Spengler's going to do then is to apply Gertan, the principles of Gertan comparative morphology to culture. And he's going to say then, he's going to basically treat civilizations as giant uh, Gertan ur plants that have a predetermined life cycle, just as we can say that any biological organism has a predetermined life cycle. So too do cultures have predetermined life cycles. And he says that uh, the ideal life cycle, just as the ideal life of a man is three score years and ten, uh, is a thousand years. This becomes a somewhat problematic model. It works very well in the West, doesn't work so well, I think, for the Eastern civilizations like India and China. Um, there's a problem there because India is a, three, is a culture with a 3,000 year arc, any way you cut it, from 1500 BC to 1500 AD. We've got a 3,000 year cultural development there, and a real decline of culture does not set into India until about the 12th century AD when it begins to disintegrate, stiffen up fall apart and exhibits all the phenomena of decay and disintegration that Spangler says is characteristic of the civilization phase of a society. But it comes awfully late for uh, this to be encompassed by a 1,000-year arc. Uh, for example, uh, Indian art is something that climaxes during the Gupta period, which is something like 400 AD, I believe. And this is long after the nihilistic period introduced by Buddha, uh, nearly a thousand years before that, which Spangler says marks the beginning of the end of the uh, the interior extermination of the, the thought phase of the culture. And he has the uh, Emperor Ashoka, uh, who is the great um, Indian emperor who converts to Buddhism. This is about 200, roughly 200 BC, who forms the first great Indian empire as the equivalent of the, um, the Roman Empire, the great imperium that comes at the end of civilization. But yet we have the problem then, by that point, in terms of Spengler's predictions, Indian art ought to be finished up and in decline. It's just getting started, though, at that point. Indian art starts getting off the ground uh, in the f just about the time of Ashoka with Buddhist art first, and then it starts getting going in the first couple of centuries, and it takes it four or five centuries to climax with the great floraison of the Gupta period of art. And um, so it doesn't quite fit the model there. So there, there are a number of anomalies that I want you to be aware of that don't quite fit in with what Spengler's saying here. The Western societies from Egypt and Mesopotamia and the Levantine world that he calls the Magian world and the West and the classical civilization all work out pretty well on this thousand year model. Uh, but the cultures of the East are a little more troubling for the model and, and imply that there might be something wrong with the model. Maybe cultures are not organisms. The whole model stands or falls on <coughs> whether cultures are in fact super organisms. He's basically saying that a culture is a super organism uh, the cells of it are basically human beings, and the soul of it is basically the, the collective intelligence, the collective unconscious of an entire civilization uh, that has a particular understanding of being that represents that culture's urphenomen, its, its primary symbol. Each culture will have a different prime symbol. Uh, the body was the prime symbol for the Greeks. Infinite space, as we saw, is the prime symbol for uh, Western Europe. And so they each have a different prime symbol. and. Um, they have, a definite, they have a definite morphology. Each culture begins, he says, um, he has a sort of mystical idea about the origin of culture. He says, a culture is born in the moment when a great soul awakens out of the proto-spirituality of ever-childish humanity and detaches itself, a form from the formless, a bounded and mortal thing from the boundless and enduring. It blooms on the soil of an exactly definable landscape to which plant-wise it remains bound. It dies when this soul has actualized the full sum of its possibilities in the shape of peoples, languages, dogmas, arts, states, sciences, and reverts into the proto-soul. But its living existence, that sequence of great epochs which define and display the stages of fulfillment, is an inner passionate struggle to maintain the idea against the powers of chaos without and the unconscious muttering deep down within. Um, so he has this idea, again, it's consistent with the Gertan model in that we don't have any reference to causes here. Cultures just come into being. We don't know why or how, according to Spangler. He doesn't give any causes. So he's got this kind of mystical idea that uh, cultures are a type of species of human society that appears suddenly, for no good reason, uh, out of a clear blue sky, out of a random landscape, and just configures itself. Um, Toynbee, on the other hand, coming out of the British systematic method, the more uh, causally oriented Darwinian method, um, in his theory of challenge and response, we'll give a causal theory. Uh, according to Toynbee, the first generation 
of civilizations that came into being with Egypt and Mesopotamia uh, came into being as the result of a challenge presented by the specific difficulties of living and adapting to the problems of a particular landscape. Uh, in Egypt, this was the problem of uh, draining off the swamps and the delta and of creating a civilization, a hydraulic civilization based on irrigation and harnessing these uh, floodwaters of the, uh, of the Nile. So the problem there was the response to a difficult landscape. And, it, and the difficulty of the landscape, it has to be very difficult, but not too difficult uh, as a civilization in the, in the Arctic would be impossible because the landscape would be too, uh, would, would squash out any possible effective response. So it has to be difficult because difficulty produces greatness, um, according to Toynbee. And, um, and then the response is the creation of these societies. So he gives a causal uh, scenario, precisely the, the systematist that Spangler accuses the British largely of uh, exhibiting and exemplifying. He wants you to know that <clears throat> the application of a cultural morphology model to history is very much opposed to the Darwinian way of doing things. His view of Darwin's view of evolution is that um, evolution is right in the sense that obviously things evolve and change, forms come into being, uh, but it's wrong in that it's basically, he says, uh, an application of British uniformitarianism, geological uniformitarianism, which infects British economic theory uh, just as much as it, in, as it infects uh, Darwin's particular version of the theory of evolution by natural selection, in which things are constantly slowly undergoing changes, mutations are put out randomly that are then selected by the environment, which is a kind of editing force, notice, not a creative force at all. It's a mutation force that's creative, and so Spangler's going to side with the mutation force that is, he's going to see as the creative thing here, and it knows what it's doing. It's not random. Mutations uh, in this comparative morphological tradition aren't put forth randomly. They're put forth in anticipation of a future because they're linked to this destiny idea that he opposes to the causality principle. The destiny idea always involves in f culture forms, in nature, an intuition of what's to come. Uh, just as he says, for example, even in works of cultural phenomena like Plato's Timaeus, uh, gives us a glimpse of the kind of religious syncretism that will later come to characterize to characterize the Roman Imperium. Um, and he says also that phenomena like Wagner's Parsifal will give us a glimpse of what our later religious phenomena will come to look like as we approach the creation of our Imperium, our Western Imperium, which always involves a reversion to what he calls a second religiousness. So a second religiousness is what will come in at the end of a civilization to characterize it as it dies down uh, in its civilization phase, reverts back to Mother Earth in a very primal type of existence, and then religious forms come back in to dominate the consciousness and push out the intellect, just as it was in the beginning. Uh, all the cultures begin as fundamentally pious and religious, um, and then they gradually move into these phases. So the morphology of the civilization has phases to it, just like Earth's planet has successive phases. Uh, we have uh, a pre-culture period, then an early culture period, a late culture period, and then finally the civilization phase. And the civilization phase is a couple of sub-phases along with it as well. It ends in the creation of an imperium, uh, which is the state form that concludes every great civilization, the creation of an empire and a dictator, centralized power, um, and a, a zoological power struggle, a reversion to brute force in politics, and along with that, the invasion of a new religiosity. In the late classical world, this was all the, the mystery cults, Mithraism, Monarchianism, and Mandianism, and uh, all the various uh, Persian cults that, that infected uh, the worship of Sibylle and Osiris, that, that infected the late classical mentality as a kind of second religiousness. Um, so he sees cultures coming full circle. They always come full circle. And then... Um, so this idea then of homology and analogy, he's going to take to apply if, if cultures are organisms, and that's a big if here. Spangler has received a lot of criticism for this idea that cultures function as organisms. It may be the case that they're not organisms at all, and that this is just a metaphor. Uh, but the question then becomes whether they function enough like organisms to justify the use of the metaphor, which I think they do, actually. And some of the criticisms that were leveled uh, against Spangler on this, on this score are similar to those that were leveled uh, by scientists against James Lovelock's Gaia hypothesis, where he sees the entire planet as a single giant organism, a single superorganism with the capacity to self-regulate uh, and metabolize and 
achieve a state of homeostasis and keep it that way. He also received a lot of criticism for that, saying that you can't, the Earth cannot be a single giant organism. After all, it can't reproduce itself. Uh, it has to be something more akin to an ecosystem. Uh, so Spangler, the, there are some of those, it, it is possible that uh, it's, we're just dealing with a metaphor here. But in any case, if we follow the metaphor, stick with Spangler and follow the metaphor of culture, uh, of civilizations as organisms, and he's going to apply the principle from comparative morphology of the homology and analogy. And he's going to say then, we can see certain homological distinctions just as we saw that the swim bladder of the fish was homologous to the lungs in a human being. They're the same organ, even though they perform different functions. We can say so too that Alexander is homologous with Napoleon. Uh, the Gothic cathedrals are homologous with the Egyptian pyramids. Uh, the Crusades are homologous with the Trojan Wars. The uh, Indian uh, Buddhism is homologous with Roman Stoicism, and so on. Um, these are morphologically exact because they occur on the timelines. If you line the timelines of each civilization up from the point at which they crystallize, let's say with the classical world we've got 1100 BC, and with the Western European world we've, we've got uh, roughly 1200 uh, AD, then the Gothic period corresponds to the Doric world, and so in that sense they are what Spengler calls contemporary with each other. Um, the Crusades correspond to the Trojan War, the uh, Homeric epics correspond to the Arthurian romances, uh, and so forth. Moving down the line, then Dante uh, then corresponds to uh, Hesiod, the beginnings of the formation of a, of a theogony, of a cosmology. Moving down the line, in which uh, later then, uh, as you move into the early, uh, later culture period, in which the morphology shifts from a religious to a, a philosophical worldview. Uh, Pythagoras becomes homologous with Descartes, uh, and so forth down the line. Uh, Plato and um, Aristotle are homologous with Goethe and Kant, and uh, classical music is homologous with sculpture. Uh, Lysippus is homologous with Beethoven. Wagner, who comes in the civilization period, then becomes homologous with the art of uh, Pergamony. Per Pergamony art is, is theatrical. Uh, the sculptures are very uh, melodramatic and bombastic, uh, very much like uh, Wagnerian art. But it's very melodramatic. It's lost its classical calm and reserve, and is beginning to verge into the hysterical in both cases. And they occur, re respectively, on their timelines at about the same time. The Punic Wars, uh, the wars between Rome and the Carthaginians, uh, where Hannibal was the big bad guy, as Spangler says, correspond to the World Wars. And so we can say, although he doesn't say this, but then because uh, he didn't live uh, into the Second World War, he died, I think, in 1936. We can say then that Han uh, Hannibal is homologous with Hitler, and the two wars are homologous with each other because they are both decisive struggles for uh, the against um, the values of what type of civilization is going to prevail. In the case of the Carthaginian Wars, the Punic Wars. The wars against Rome and the Carthaginians, as Bakufen said in the 19th century, were um, not just wars over economics and resources. A, an historian like Mommsen, in his History of Rome, who represents the kind of thinker that Spangler uh, is disparaging here as the systematic thinker, the systematist, uh, will reduce that kind of history to merely economic problems. But Bakufen, who represents the kind of physiognomic thinker, uh, will say that the culture, the war was, a, was about culture. The Roman Imperium. Uh, versus the Carthaginian uh, worship of the Great Mother, the Mother Goddess, human sacrifice, uh, an older, uh, more archaic uh, way of life was being fought against with the Romans, uh, the transition to what would, would become uh, a, an empire based on rational uh, respect, rationalism, respect for the individual, and patriarchy as over against matriarchy. Um, so it's a war uh, of values against an, an archaic, a society that has a residue of the ancient human sacrifice and the myth of the goddess versus a society that is based on Apollonian rationalism and paternal law and authority. Um, that's what that war was fought over, just as I was saying the other day that the, the world wars were fought over Kultur, the Germans trying to preserve and hang on to this outmoded way of life in which civilization is motivated by artistic principles versus the Allies uh, moving on into the mega machine, the, the megalopolitan world of civilization, and that war of values there. So these are uh, morphologically homologous types of wars, and the, the end result of both of them is to create a civilization that will become an imperium. We saw what happened in the case of Rome, and so Spangler says that we should be able to make predictions now in the morphological model that we too 
will enter into a period of a universal state, uh, the creation of an imperium. And so that's the gist of this chapter.